two and one. All right, everybody. Um, I'm Hugo Ban Anderson uh, here with Out of Bounds and Metaflow, and very excited to welcome you all to our uh, panel and, and release party um, for two books by uh, the esteemed uh, Chip Huen and uh, Ville Tulos. Um, we're going to take a few minutes to allow everybody to come in. And uh, while we do that, um, if you'd like to introduce yourself in the YouTube chat uh, and let us know why you're here, what your interest in uh, operationalizing, productionizing machine learning is, um, or your interest in machine learning education in, in general, um, it would be so fantastic for, for you to introduce yourself and, and let us know. Um, so we'll just take a couple of minutes to let people uh, roll on in and then, then we'll get started with, with the fun of today. Ah, of course, and as Chip says, let us know where, where you're calling in from. Hey, we have Carlos Layson from Mexico City. That's fantastic. Um, if other people could let us know where you're calling in from um, and let us know what your interests in machine learning are um, and, uh, you know, what type, what type of work you do, for, for example. Um, hey, Jim Grumman, great, great to see you here. Calling in from Chicago, another from Chicago. We got Vancouver, Singapore, um, Brazil. Um, Aditya Nanduri is interested in going beyond building models and actually deploying them as services and products within my organization. Well, you've come to the, to the right place. We have Jeffy from Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, this is fantastic, getting excited already. Uh, Montreal and Columbia, beautiful. Uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, hey, if you're just joining everyone, we're gonna take a couple of minutes for everyone to introduce themselves in the chat. I know a lot of people are saying where they're from. It'd be fantastic also to know uh, what your interest in machine learning is. Um, and what type of work you do as well. I'm actually interested in what type of verticals are attempting to adopt uh, machine learning currently and what, and what type of companies. Um, so uh, Thierry is interested in building robust and reproducible pipelines for scientific health research. Beautiful. Um, robustness, key. Reproducibility, um, incredible. And we're here to talk about science. Sacramento, Jamaica, Singapore, Vancouver, Cuba. Fantastic. Wow, we've got, you know, we've got people representing from all around the world. Um, I wonder, once we had a live stream where someone tuned in from Antarctica, um, which I found fascinating because I, um, I appreciate that um, type of bandwidth is expensive. Okay, we'll take one more minute to let people in. Um, and if you're just joining, if you could let us know where you're calling from, what your interest in machine learning is, um, and what type of work you do. That'd be super cool. Um, oh, this is great. We have a DevOps. Uh, we have Mario, who's a DevOps SRE uh, engineer, interested in getting to MLOps. I love this direction as well. It's fantastic, not only to have people from the data science and science space coming down into thinking about, um, you know, building uh, reproducible and operationalizing machine learning, but people from the ops side as well. Um, Kaylin Medeiros, uh, Brooklyn, New York City, building first ML models at metabolic health focused health tech startup. Um, Kaylin, great to see you here. Um, for those who, some of you may know, Kaylin is, is, is an old friend and a uh, former colleague of mine. And it's so, so lovely to see uh, friendly names popping up as well. Um, Rick is currently working in data science, uh, in the data science space for cybersecurity and insurance in the Bay Area. Niagara Falls, great. We have a DevOps engineer. This is fantastic. And we, we have over 50 people here already, which is incredibly exciting. Um, I think we've heard enough of my voice already. It's five past the hour, now now six. Um, and I think it is, it, it's now time to, to get started. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'd love um, Villay and Chip to turn their cameras on so we can, we can jump in. Hey, hello, Villay. Hello, Hugo. How are you? I'm, I'm great. So great to be here today. Very exciting and, and wonderful to, I mean, one, hey Chip, how are you? Hey there, I, I just read the comment and see the semi boy here to um, they have read my work and to all these people prepare to be disappointed. Uh, but yeah, hi. 
always prepare to be disappointed. I think that's a, that's a, that's, you know, as, you know. Good life principle. Well, as, as we say, you know, from this side of things, um, under promise and over deliver. But I don't think that's, that's not necessarily the, but it, I mean, what are your reactions to seeing all these people from different parts of the space? As I said, seeing the science people, then the DevOps people and people from all around wanting to join, to be interested in this, I find inspiring. Um, are you excited? Yeah, I think this is pretty awesome. And I'm sorry, it's also from Cuba. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, I don't think I've ever been to an event with someone from Cuba. I wish I wish we could have like more um, here from. Absolutely. Yes, I'm on a treadmill. <laughs> well, there is, there is a first time um, for everything. Um, so I thought just to set the scene a bit by saying a few words about what we're here for, um, and then we're going to jump in because people are not here to to listen listen to me. But um, I wanted to say um, that part of the motivation here is that the machine learning space is maturing so quickly um, that we're really in need of relevant, technical, correct, and state of the art educational resources. And that's why I'm really excited to have um, a panel with, with with you two who work in this space in a variety of different different ways. Um, so we're here to celebrate and talk about um, the broader space around two books. The first is Chip, your your recent book, Designing Machine Learning Systems. Um, and for those who, who don't know, um, Chip is co-founder and CEO of uh, Claypot AI and a writer um, and, and computer scientist who builds infrastructure for real-time machine learning and teaches ML systems design at Stanford. Um, the other book that we're really excited about today is Effective Data Science Infrastructure by Ville Toulos. Um, and Ville is co-founder and CEO of Out of Bounds, um, the company, a company, our company between human centric, um, which we'll get to, which we, we can, all of us here consider mm -hmm. inc incredibly important, full stack platform for machine learning and data science powered by uh, the open source Metaflow, um, which Ville and, and colleagues uh, built at, at Netflix, um, and open sourced in, in, in 2019. Um, so the kind of topics we're gonna to talk around are the pressing challenges in ML education, what data scientists need to know about practical uh, ML in, oh, am I still there? In moving from research and prototype mm -hmm. to production um, and how these education projects fit into the broader context of the full uh, ML stack. Um, we're also going to give a, a small demo of um, machine learning playground, a sandbox we've, we've built recently. But part of the rationale behind that is that there are so many moving parts of the stack from like orchestrators to data in databases and parquet shards on S3 and you need Kubernetes clusters and like my mind's bending already thinking about all these things. Mm -hmm. And we want people to be able to like test out tools without having to set up all this infrastructure themselves. So getting data scientists working um, with new tools as, as quickly as possible. So I'll give a small demo of that at, at the end. We'll be excited for everyone's everyone's feedback. Um, that's just to contextualize um, what, what, we're, uh, what we're doing here. I, I see there are comments already around um, Chip's treadmill desk. I'm incredibly jealous and I'm yeah, taking this- Yeah, moving as, more. Exactly, I'm taking this as yeah. inspiration um, to- I'm keyboarding from ML Ops to Treadmill desk, treadmill. Yeah, and, and I think the next step would be. I mean, I've, I get back pain as as well, so I swim a lot. Backstrokes <laughs> the best. I feel like a desk that I can do backstroke swimming with is definitely the <laughs> the, the next ab absurd level of, of this. But um, new meaning for the live stream. So actually being in a suit. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's yeah. got to be one of the great dad jokes. Um, so without further ado. I'd, I'd really love to jump into the types of things we're here to to talk about. Um, Wait, I think before we start, I know that a lot of people are here because uh, I want to try their luck with the book. So oh, do you want to share more? Yes. Absolutely. And this is this is totally my bad. This was on my, I got so excited. <laughs> this was on my um, uh, talking point list, but we are giving away books um, from today's live stream. The way we're doing it, because raffles are generally challenging to do on YouTube is... Um, we're going to have an, an async AMA with Chip and Ville um, af afterwards. Um, and so we're going to give books away as a function of questions there. So I'm posting a link to the Slack where we're doing, doing this. Um, and if you join the AMA guest channel, and I'll post this in announcements there as well, um, please ask questions afterwards. And, the, and Ville and Chip, 
will will choose um, what they consider to be um, the most interesting or the, their favorite questions. And to the people who um, ask those questions, we'll DM you, we'll get your address and, and, and send you out, send you out copies, co copies of the book, um, uh, which, which we're really very, very excited to do. Um, great. So I think that's, that's all our bookkeeping. Um, forgive the pun. Um, yeah, I, didn't, no, I didn't even intend that. Said, that choke, so. Yeah, yeah, I saw, I saw yeah. Billet smirk and I was like, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> so we're here to talk about education. And I, I, I have a sense Chip may turn some of these questions on me, which I'm excited for as well. But um, I'm, I'm excited to, to think through why education is so critical right now in machine learning. So perhaps Chip, you could tell us your thoughts about that. Then we can move, move to Ville. Wait, why me? Why do you have to go first? I'm just, um, so I think um, education is a very interesting. And I think yesterday I was talk, asking like Hugo, Hugo and Ville, like what does education mean to you? So um, I think like education is, a, so, so I come from a world where um, people very like place an important value on fundamental knowledge. So a lot of things, uh, so, so I think um, it would be interesting to see a different shape between like what is easy to learn and what is hard to learn. And even like if it's hard, whether it's like interesting hard or like a boring hard. So say uh, something that's very easy to acquire is like something question like what is the diameter of the earth, right? It's like something very easy to just look up, right? Or, or like how to do this, uh, how to do a dictionary in Python, like that's easy to look up. So like what is, um, so what are the hard things to learn uh, would be like, um, say doing calculus or like say a hard thing to learn. And between that, I say the interesting hard and boring hard, say learning a new language is hard, but it's not that like, for example, like if you come from a, a Python world, if you can to learn Java, like yes, you probably can learn it, but it's, it, whether it's gonna be like interesting in the process, it's just like very procedural. You just go through a list of process and whereas it's hard, it would be like, okay, now we have a system that works like how do you scale this? to a large amount of system, or like now we have a tool that is very much targeted toward the engineers or infra engineers. How do we change that to make it like easy for the scientists to, to use? So that could be a very interesting mm -hmm. and hard challenge. So, uh, so I think like for format of education, we, we do need to think about like what good, what would you want to acquire through that education process? And for different kind of things, like whether it's hard or easy, whether it's interesting or boring, we have very different way to learn it. I'm not sure as a very long-winded mm -hmm. answer. No, I, I appreciate that answer. I suppose what I really want to get to as well is, is why it's so important for machine learning right now, as opposed to other, other like, I think for example, let's look at data analytics, right? So perhaps there are, there are solidified concepts there. We've recognized a lot of the patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and so education there, I think it's more obvious what needs to be taught there. Whereas I suppose, is there an argument that this space is so evolve, evolving so quickly that we really need education to help define certain, certain things? So I feel like a lot of education, I'm oh, sorry, I have to keep on talking. Um, should, okay, so I'm gonna just finish this part and feel like yeah. you can jump in. Um, yeah, so I think like a lot of education today focus on what is like easy to learn and a tutorial style. So yeah. I think there's a vast majority of like, not much, but I haven't really, taken some money and it kind of creates a percentage. But I see a lot of people like, hey, how to do X in Python? How to do X in TensorFlow? How to do YZ in like different kind of framework? And, and for, for me, like that is like very practical, but I think, uh, I wonder like how transferable it is. Mm -hmm. so, so say, I think one thing I, I realized that tools change very quickly. So a lot of what we consume are like very specific to a certain tool that we just keep on like, it's like never ending treadmill. We just, no pun intended. It's just like, it's just because you keep always have to look up things, like new things, uh, always new coming up. And, and it's a process, it might be too noisy and we don't really get to the core of like what makes things like challenging or interesting. That makes perfect sense. So Ville, maybe you can use our reflection so far as a springboard to talk about why you think education is so important in machine learning currently. Yeah, no, and I, I love like Chip's characterization about like things that are hard but interesting to learn. And then I, I think that definitely the topics that we are talking about today are more on the kind of the harder side and like it definitely takes some deep thought to do it well. But the reason like why I feel that it's so important to do it these days is that 
I feel like we are still in, in super early days of ML adoption, but at the same time, it feels that the possible number of possible applications is, is just exploding. It, it, to me, it feels that it's almost like setting up an e-commerce store in 1998. So, you know, like that moment in time when it feels that like we are on the, on the, on the edge, on the verge of something really big, like kind of everybody knows that like machine learning data science is here to stay. But at the same time, nobody quite knows how to do it well. And everybody kind of knows that like over the next 10 years, um, like probably it will be more mainstream and everything will be more mature. But it feels that that like there's so much learning to do and like so much education that needs to take place. And uh, and also I think that like everybody, like even in this stream today, I mean, like all of us are like pretty much on the bleeding edge. So it's kind of, it may feel that, oh, I mean, like people have been thinking and doing, and especially many of you, like, let's say who are like new to the journey, it might feel that, oh my gosh, I mean, like there's so much to learn, but I mean, like all of you, I mean, like everybody is like really on the kind of the bleeding edge compared to those people, the mainstream who will start, who will start thinking about these things in 10 years time or five years time. And I think that that's why I mean, it's so exciting to kind of uh, be on this journey, like with everybody to kind of try to educate and like share, because it's also a fact that there are companies, of course, like Netflixes and then Googles and many others of the world who have been doing this for a while now, still like super early days. But I mean, there are some lessons that have been learned and at least we can share those and then like help everybody to kind of get a bit of a leap start. So to Absolutely. Speak, so. That makes perfect so sense. I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was just going to ask, I, I think yeah. in terms of education, um, part of education involves pattern recognition of what happens yeah. in, in, mm -hmm. in the field, right? And something you mentioned in the preface to your book, Chip, is that um, each case, well, a lot of machine learning cases are both complex and, and, and unique. So when writing books where you want to, you know, perform some sort of pattern recognition to talk about cases that um, a, a more general, how, how do we even think about this when it seems like each is, is, is both complex and, and, and unique? What are the trends or how do we find the trends when everything's complex and unique? So I think these ideas, I, um, so what I mentioned, I think can tie back to what Vile said. I think a, a, a word that Vile said that we stood out to me is share. So for me, I think of education is more of a one directional, right? Education means like there's someone who's educating and some another person being educated. So so education, I think this works really well when what is trying, being transferred from the person doing the education and educating and the person being educated is like very clear and unambiguous, right? But I think we're still in the phase, I'm not sure where we are to quit ML ops, I'm not sure we're at the phase when things are very well defined. So for that one directional content to be uh, to, to, to work, I do think we still pay where we need to hear from own side. So it's less about education, it's about sharing and discussing mm. and like coming up with like come on, agree upon solutions. I like that a lot. And this is something we actually discussed yesterday, right? I mean, I mentioned in passing that. I don't think education is a one-way street of someone in broadcast mode telling telling people that, it, especially in a space that's evolving like this, it needs to be a, a conversation. So by the way, I mean, please ask questions on the chat. Exactly. exactly. For that reason, so we yeah. can make this two ways. So. Yeah, please do. I mean, the joke is that this is broadcast mode, um, but <laughs> also please do ask <laughs> questions on, on, on the chat. Um, I, I'm interested in books. Um, I also, I, mm, so a lot of the time when I need to be unblocked um, mm -hmm. data science or machine learning work, Stack Overflow will help me. There are other types of resources, um, docu yep. like Metaflow documentation on um, which, the, I mean, the docs are fantastic. Um, but um, the, these types of things. So I'm wondering um, why did you decide to write a book? It's a huge investment um, uh, instead of focusing on other forms of content, which can help um, data practitioners. So, Ville, maybe you can speak speak to that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a it's a good question, and definitely a question I ask myself even before I I promised to start writing a book. I mean, the, really, the lingering question in my mind was that do like why would one like write a book these days? Why not have all the material online? And I guess there are like a couple of like reasons, like a couple of motivations for me personally. Um, one is that uh, like every time I gave a presentations about a topic online or like in any kind of a conference or anything, usually there's some like a pretty hard time limit, like a 30 minutes, 45 minutes, or like when you've read a blog post, I mean, like maybe you have a thousand words or something like that. And, uh, and, and, and really, like, as we have been discussing here already, I mean, these are complex topics. There's a lot of depth into the stack and it felt that it would be really useful to have a long form content, long form treaties of, of like everything that's really like relevant for these questions, at least. To, to, to a kind of a, with, within a certain scope. 
And uh, I mean, it's a fact that at least I feel I'm personally like I, I grew up with books. I really like books. And uh, I, I think people have been learning stuff like true books, like for for centuries now. So um, I, I think that there's still a lot of value in that format. Also, like one thing that I do want to mention is that I do still think, I mean, this may be a controversial take that publishers actually do add value. I do have to thank like everybody at Manning that I think that they put in a lot of hours making sure that the content is actually uh, really readable and, and useful. And I, I think that that actually like takes some special expertise and I, I think that they are really good at it. So I, I think that there's a value add that even publishers add like to the process. So, so yeah. I agree with those points completely. How about you, Chip? Why a book? Yeah, I think um, I really like books as a learning format. So for me, uh, I think a lot of people like can read content online, uh, tweets, even like you can learn things from tweets, right? Uh, but I do think that's like I see it by reading a book is like focus work. So when you do a lot of like art, reading a lot of article, medium posts, there's a lot of context switching because like a lot of article, like probably like try to get into the right middle state and then you finish reading, you jump to other stuff. And you, and whereas I see reading a book is like, yeah, I, I really want to learn deeply about this topic. And I do believe it's like, so I'm not sure you have this experience when you work with someone and you can tell like how much effort they put into that because like you can see like how much you get out of working with that person, right? So I do think something I see similar build on content. I do see this like if the person creates the content, put a lot of effort into that. I feel like after when I read the content, I feel like I get a lot out of it. So 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 I do I do hope that um so so I'm not saying that like my books put a lot of con like it's like um but but it's like it's from the reader perspective. I do enjoy reading books, especially books from writers, authors, I do things as they put a lot of effort and I feel like I get a lot more out of it rather than reading like a, a short post or even like a book where people don't really care or they just like write a book for the sake of writing a book. Um, and, and because so I like books, you can pretty see I have a bookshelf on, <laughs> behind me. So disclaimer, I, I I read a lot on Kindle. People told me that I should put a bookshelf there to make to make myself look more smart on calls. <laughs> um, but I do read those books. Um, and um, for, for me, writing a book was not like to write a book because I read published book before so like the, I don't really feel a lot of like crazy excitement like like it's not it's not like a goal for me to publish another book it's more about like it was it was more like a byproduct because I do see it as part of the learning process so am I talking too long no I'll, I'll definitely uh, I'll definitely cut you off if you are okay yes um so so I think like um uh, this is uh, learning right like somebody so I find a very difficult way to learn if it come, I come up with very generic questions like, hey, tell me what you think about MLO. Because then the conversation can go like everywhere. Mm -hmm. But whereas like, I think the, uh, there's something on CNET will say like the best way to figure out was the right answer is so to say the wrong answer and yeah. put a correct to you. Yeah. So I do think of writing as a way for me to propose my may not be correct answers, but then I will figure out after I publish it and they will tell me, hey, that is wrong. So I feel like I get a yeah. lot more through that process. So, so I have been starting writing like uh, in ML of space like for, for a pretty long time. I think I published a, um, a short version of my book online back in 2019. Mm. So, and I, I got a lot of feedback um, through the process. And then I saw like I taught a course twice. Um, I got a lot of like more iterations and feedback through the two editions of the course. And then it was like, and then it became like a book eventually. So it was yeah. not like, oh, I write a book because they're writing a book. It was more for me to get feedback from people. Absolutely. And a lot in there resonates with me, and particularly this idea that I think writing also is a way of creating thought. Um, and it's a tool that allows you to um, solidify or coagulate or break down exactly what's what's happening in, in the world, like transmitted th through you. So it's a way of actually clarifying, um, you know, the type of education we want, we want to put out there. Um, there are so many wonderful questions from, from the crowd. I do want to mention one thing. You mentioned Medium posts. I, I love Medium. Um, for some reasons, I dislike it for others. Someone mentioned Medium posts helped them. I will say I didn't state Medium originally um, because I think there's we've actually got a huge quality um, check problem with, with a lot of Medium that doesn't happen in documentation of open source frameworks and doesn't happen in, in, in Stack Overflow. So I think that's... That's that's worth mentioning. That isn't to say there aren't a lot of wonderful things on Medium, but there are actually a lot of incorrect things on, on Medium um, due to the lack of the crowdsourcing um, nature of it. Um, I'll ask one of the questions in, in, in the chat. There are so many interesting ones and we won't be able to get to all of them. Please continue to ask asking them, but any of the ones that um, we don't get to, we can chat about in Slack after the fact mm -hmm. as well. Um, but as we're here, I want to kind of focus on the education 
specific ones. Uh, Thierry uh, Jean or Jean has a wonderful question. Um, they're wondering how to promote continuous learning and upskilling of data scientists and data engineers in the workplace. Um, so do you have any thoughts about how, how we can think that through? Well, I, I, can, I can start. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I guess first, I mean, I, I think that the same question, of course, could be asked about any topic. And I think like whatever you do, I mean, the same applies to software engineers and marketing and sales and, and so forth. I think continuous learning is, is probably a good idea as a kind of a life principle. Mm. Now, I think that like in a, in a field like ours, that arguably is still in, in, in such early days, I think it's like, I mean, it, it would be hard to imagine not like kind of learning. I mean, given that like things move so fast anyways. Um, but I mean, like how to, how to encourage it. Uh, I think like overall, like one approach uh, that like we have been advocating, I know that like different organizations do this a bit differently is, is this idea that data scientists actually can do more by themselves. And I think that it is actually quite empowering, uh, when, when like you can kind of like increase your scope. But now I know that like, especially in the field like ours, it might feel that like, oh my gosh, I mean, like I'm being asked to do everything. And I know many data scientists have the feeling that they are being asked to do the modeling and the data engineering and infrastructure engineering and distributed systems engineering. And that's not the idea, but rather the idea is that like, as the kind of the tooling improves and like, as all these like surrounding systems improve, then you can actually like maybe the quote or misquote cheap. I mean, kind of a do more of the kind of the interesting, but maybe kind of a challenging stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that is a, I, at least like I, I would hope for many people kind of like a positive motivation to learn more. And because you can also do more and you can accomplish more. And of course, like you can help your colleagues, you can help your organization by doing that. And I know that like some organizations have a bit more tightly scoped roles, but I, I think that that's also something that will be changing over time. I mean, like, again, I mean, like drawing, analogs to the to the um to the web stack that like there used to be like kind of a people setting up web servers and like people writing whatever html and people writing the backend scripts and now we have full stack developers and they can do much more and it's actually quite exciting how much you can do even as a single full stack developer so i would imagine that something similar could happen with data science but yeah i mean it will take some continuous learnings great chip do you have any thoughts on this yeah, uh, I think like for, for the matter of like upskilling data scientists, I do think it's, uh, so there was a question would be like where the bottleneck to the learning and upskilling is. So so one thing is this, like, we, I do believe is like, if people don't want to learn, if someone who doesn't want to learn, I don't think organization can force them to learn. Like, it's just mm -hmm. not gonna happen. And second, like, okay, assuming that the, what the person wants to learn, then what's the bottleneck? And I think a lot of, of people assume that it is a lack of materials, but I don't think there's a lack of like materials content for data science, machine learning, ML ops. It's a question of like, how do you filter that kind of like some like an enormous amount of information and I like, see what is like, one is like, useful and second is relevant to the uh, to the persons and third is like relevant to the, to the organization the person works at. So I do think it's like one way they've seen a pretty, um, Good is that even our the organization has a pretty clear understanding of like what kind of skill they want that in scientists to acquire, and then like crafting maybe like recommendations and recommended courses. So we do really some like kind of sort of curator and give files and materials that like help that data scientist like most relevant to both the data scientists and the the company. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes perfect sense. Um, so as we're talking about data scientists in organizations. Um, I mean, you've both spoken with hundreds, if not more data scientists around the work they do and the challenges they face. I'm wondering um, what you think the biggest challenges are faced by working data scientists today. Do you want to go first, Chip? I feel like both are out of bounds and clay for the infrastructure, infrastructure companies, right? So yep. I guess we, we kind of uh, agree, or like at least Vivian, three of us is, uh, I'm not sure I can't speak for you, Google. Maybe you think a secret, like crypto, so on everything. So I don't know that yet. Um, but I do think that like uh, infrastructure is going to be a huge challenge. So I'm just say something like very, very simple. Um, um, we see that a lot of data scientists actually, first of all, like they, they don't have tools to do what they need. Um, like it's like because they don't have enough resources available, or they they just like companies like investing in tools that make them more productive. Or, or maybe like the problems they face is like can be really, really hard. So, um, so I work in real-time machine learning and one common challenge we see is like the trend predict inconsistency. So like you're doing online predictions, you might use some features that require online computations. 
say you get the average transaction values in the last 30 minutes. So, so during predictions, you have like a different kind of code to, to compute that. So we have to use fling or splash streaming, right? But during training, we have to use the same feature, but on historical data. And it's like maybe in Pandas or Spark or whatever you use. So mm-hmm. that has a mismatch. So we see a lot of companies, like when after the scientists create some what they oh great model as well, great offline. But then like somebody else has to translate that code mm-hmm. or that feature into the online environment. And many companies, it's like, they just don't invest in the process to make it faster. So we talk to a company and say, oh, they will do that like once a quarter because that's mm-hmm. only when they can allocate like some engineers to do that for them. And it's just like, it's just a bottleneck. Like data scientists like just don't, like what is the point like of like trying to improve the model if it's not going to happen like three months down the line. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How about you, Villa? Yeah, no, I, I think it's obvious that like there's so much to be done on the tooling side. And I, I think like a chip, like mentioned that well so maybe i'll just add something that i I do think that is also like an interesting challenge for many data science which is organizational issues like all the way going to the leadership and and the fact that at the end of the day um ml is not an end goal by itself data science is not an end goal by itself i mean it it is there to to kind of actually service some larger goal like produce business value help 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 the world whatever it might be and but I mean, it really takes some like a vision, like from the leadership level as well, to really understand like how we can be effective with with machine learning, and uh, and I, I think that that's something that like many organizations still have to learn that like how, how to do it well. Also, the fact that that let's say in order to do in order to be really effective with data science, like you need to adopt a bit of an experimentation culture, like which means that like things will fail. I mean, that is pretty much the definition of the experimentation. It's almost like kind of a, if you think about empirical science, I mean, the idea with empirical science is that yes, I mean, like kind of, you don't always succeed. I mean, like negative results are interesting results as well. And uh, and like in, in many business environments, I mean, this is, this is not like in their DNA. I mean, the idea that like you have projects that maybe don't, don't deliver immediately. I mean, that might be, quite quite new to them and uh, something that they they don't actually um encourage and that might be a problem for data scientists as well so i think that there's there are like this organizational leadership level issues that that also like kind of i think that they will improve over time and I, I think many many organizations are actually getting really good at this so i'm i'm like very very optimistic that the that the kind of a situation will get way better like over the coming years but i know that that's still a still an issue for for many people at many places absolutely so i want to now kind of dive into not, not the books per se, but the ideas around the books, because they're also ideas in terms of the work you, you two have started doing um, as co-founders and CEOs. Before doing that, I just want to mention that both books are wonderful. Um, they're complementary, in my opinion. And if you'd like to, and you don't get one from the raffle today, um, you should definitely buy, buy both. Um, so my question around the complementary nature of your books and, and works is, as bo- both as co-founders and CEOs of startups in, in, in the space, how do you think about the complementary nature of what you're working on and how your projects fit into the broader context of the full machine learning stack? Um, Ville, perhaps you can you can speak to that first and then we can move to Chip. Yeah, well, I, I, I think like a Chip definitely needs to talk more about Claypot. That's super exciting. Of course, like what we do at Outer Bounds is that we have con- we are continuing working on, on Metaflow, which is the open source project we started at Netflix. And uh, and Metaflow much focuses on, on the kind of batch use cases, building workflows uh, that ingest data, like do transformations on data, like train models and like every all the questions related to that. Um, and that has been always our focus. Um, and I, I think that it is indeed like a complementary to many of the questions that uh, the chip is, is, has been thinking about. Um, also, like we have this idea of, of really taking a full stack approach. And like with that, like the idea that we have been focusing on really the kind of this like a lower layers of the stack in some sense, like these questions of data compute orchestration versioning. And then like kind of by design, we have been always like a bit less opinionated about like how you actually like what kind of projects you build on top of the stack. So that is that has been a deliberate decision this far. And uh, and, and it comes with with like a certain pros and cons. I, I don't know exactly like kind of a how how that relates to, to your thinking, but I mean like, well, I mean, maybe you should talk more about like your point of view. So um so um yeah, so so we, we do uh real time machine learning. So we are still in stealth. So unfortunately, there's not much we can talk about publicly, but if anyone's interested, do get in touch. So we work a lot with, um, we want to make machine learning go fast. Like, yeah, like we want to like leverage fast information to make decisions. So we do believe that fresh data is just better than stale data. And we want to like enable um, 
company to leverage precious data for the machine learning models. That, that that makes sense, and I appreciate your <laughs> your <laughs> secrecy and, and, and stealth <laughs> stealthiness while also yeah, remaining. like mysterious. Yeah, I mean, you know, you've got to you've got to create a sense of mystery around sense mm-hmm. of. We got to remember that magic is everywhere. Um, I I am interested in how you then not necessarily talk about claypot, but view the complementary nature of um, what you work on and Ville's book, and, and so maybe your book, his book, Metaflow versus the real time stuff that you're you're incredibly interested in. Um, yeah. So. Um... Yeah, so, so I do think it's like uh, Bash and streaming, they are very complementary. So, mm-hmm. so I would say we do leverage a lot of uh, streaming processes, but I guess there's really not much I can't. Yeah, go into detail, absolutely. I, I, yes. I, I, yeah. I totally get that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. To, to wrap up, um, actually, I have one question from the crowd and then I have one question f- f- from me. And my sincerest apologies that we haven't been able to get all the questions f- from the crowd, but please do join us on, on Slack in order to continue this conversation mm-hmm. over the next week or so. Um, how, how do you think about keeping these books agile and up to date with kind of the speed of, of, and velocity of the industry? I think that's a fascinating question from, um, from AJ Vikram Singh. Yeah, no, I think that that's a, definitely a question that I ask myself, like when, when starting to write a book, because obviously that's a, that applies to all technical books that like, and I, I think at least like my point of view is that I, um, in, in effective data science infrastructure, it's not so much about like specific APIs, uh, but rather kind of these general principles that are like hopefully more uh, like kind of a more permanent in some sense. And uh, and then of course the APIs may change, new APIs will come up and, and so forth. And of course, even like since like writing of the book, I mean, they have been uh, like, we have released new features of Metaflow. So, but the, I think that like everything, all those like a basic foundational issues about data, compute, orchestration and versioning, they have been here like for the past 20 years. I don't think that they will be going anywhere like over the next 10 years. So I think that like all those foundations stay. And, and in that sense, I do hope that the book will stay relevant, will stay useful for, for the next yeah. who knows how many years. But I, I think then like, of course, like when you start like implementing like a nitty gritty, like a specific things, I mean, then of course, I mean, like by all means, like everybody should be kind of Googling and using Stack Overflow, like going to the API documentation, like all the, all the good stuff that everybody does anyway, so. And Chip, how about you? Yeah, I think I think uh, it's a very interesting space, and things are moving really, really fast. So, so I would say that's like um, so there's a lot of things that we observe. Uh, first of all, like how humans and AI can interact with each other, right? Like there's a whole new world of like generative AI. I think there's a lot of applications, and I do think there's like a lot of the ways that we interact with AI is going to change, and uh, maybe like we have a lot, lot of like uh, tools that can be automated. And that would be change. That was gonna change as well. So, um, how to get a book agile? Um, that's a tough question because um, I, I think um, so. So, at least uh, for me, I think the process of this book was not like new. So, I think like it's a lot of ideas of like this has been last for like since uh, since I started writing it in like twenty nineteen. I said that doesn't seems like a lot, but in ML ops world, it's like. Quite, quite long. So I think I learned that lessons from, uh, so before I taught a course on TensorFlow and I realized it's like after TensorFlow changed from zero or 1.1 to 2.0, uh, sorry, where it's sorry, one, like TensorFlow one to TensorFlow two, like a lot of things had changed. And then, and uh, when I wanted to teach a course again, I realized I would have to like update as a 60%, 60% materials. So so one addition that I, from then on, I was like, okay, I, I don't want to be something that very much like dependent on something that can change quickly. So I do think that's like interfaces can change quickly. So if anything is very tied to a certain interface, that's going to change. But if there's something more of like fundamental, like common problems on a framework to for from storm big, that is going to change less frequently because yeah. I hope that like a uh, framework to for like how to make decisions, how to evaluate certain uh, problems. It's yeah. not going to change that fast. Well, exactly. And that's something you do wonderfully mm-hmm. in, in, in your book is talk through way, ways of thinking and mentioning that tools come and go, but we need to develop robust ways of, of thinking and foundational ways of thinking in, in, in this emergent discipline. I do love that you mentioned um, the interaction between humans and, and computation. Um, 
because that kind of leads into what my final question was. And I do, I love the last chapter of your book, Chip, um, The Human Side of Machine Learning. I love that you opened talking about user experience as well. And actually, shameless plug here, we have, if you're interested in user experience, meeting machine learning, yeah. a couple of months ago, we had um, a, a fireside chat, which you can find um, we on our um, YouTube channel here, Out of Bounds YouTube channel. That was with Michelle Carney from, from TensorFlow at, at, at Google. I'm talking about I do think that that is something that Metaflow is very good at. I think that Metaflow is very easy to use. It's very neat. I thought it was mm. like, uh, and then I realized it's like Vila. It's like you you come from a. Um, I didn't realize that Vila is a really good illustrator, and I do think just like being able to being both an artist, um, you do have more like a better sense of like how to create a good user experience. Absolutely, oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, no, I, so, I, of course, I can feel that like all the all the actual like real illustrators out there. I mean, they're like <laughs> we are not doing justice for them. But yeah, no, I, I and I do agree. Like Hugo, also like what you said about the importance, of course, of the human centricity and like Chip also like what you are writing about this like human interface. And by the way, I mean that is that is one thing that like absolutely won't change. And I, I think like going back to the previous question about like how to keep those books relevant. I think that the, the, the human interface, I mean, that won't be changing anywhere. So I think usability is definitely something that's here to stay. So. Absolutely. Um, I'll also add that, you know, working with, with Ville on a, on, on a lot of um, content um, and, and developer focused content, I think um, your, his, your illustrations are wonderful, but what they also do for me is when we're working on things together, you use illustrations to form um, a coherent mental model of what we're trying to think through and what we're trying to produce. And I, I, I'd appreciate that in your book a, a, a lot as, as well. Um, and we'll actually see some of that when we um, have a look at the, the sandbox that we've built. Um, so it's it's time for me to do a live live demo now. Um, Chip, I'm aware you you have to go, but um, I'd like to extend a very warm hearted thank you to, to you for such an engaging conversation. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk and I hope we get the opportunity to do so again in the near future. No, it was really fun. Thank you so much for host, uh, for having me. And Absolutely. it's really fun in the chat as well. Uh, I love uh, I love the questions. And yeah, please do ask, uh, I, I think that's like uh, YouTube, I think it's hard to respond to YouTube comments, I guess. Uh, yep. So thanks like be a great way. And if you want to like get in touch with me, um, I'm on email, Twitter, LinkedIn, and also on pretty active on Discord. If you want to yeah. join the Discord, uh, I'm off server. Cool. Uh, Absolutely. So, um, so we'll see yeah, you on Slack nice. over the next week. Yeah. See ya. Yeah. Awesome. Bye bye. Thanks, Chip. See you. Um, oh, I've got a sneeze coming. I think. God oh, bless you. Thank you. So I'm muted during that because it's quite loud. But Ville knows this, everyone here. But it's I'm in Sydney, Australia, and it's springtime. And um, uh, you know, allergies are allergies are rife. Um, sounds so like yes, a fun forecasting problem. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I posted once again all the amazing questions. Please do bring them to Slack. And if you do bring it to Slack, there's a chance that you'll get one or two free books as uh, as well. So repost them at slack.outofbounds.co. The channel is AMA Guests, but I posted all of that in um, in the YouTube chat. Um, and everyone's saying thanks, Chip, which is which is which is so lovely. Um, so without further ado, I um, maybe I'll contextualize this. Uh, no, actually, I'll contextualize it as as I show it because I think um, you know the proof's in the pudding, so, so to speak. But there's a huge question around how we um, can educate. So, uh, Ville, can you confirm that you can see my screen? I indeed can. Yeah. Um, and I'm just actually going to drag the YouTube so I can see the chat. As, as well over somewhere else. So if, if you bear with me as I do this, I've got you know an array of monitors here trying to, trying to do this. Um, so what I wanna show you is essentially, it's, um, it's a sandbox or a machine learning playground where you get to experiment around with, with Metaflow and all the tools uh, around it. As Ville mentioned, Metaflow isn't particularly- And by the way, Hugo, like how, how, did, how did you get to this page? Ah, yes, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. So what, yeah, no. what we do is, um, and so anyone can, can come along and play here. If you go to outofbounds.com, you can go, go to my sandbox there, but I'm actually going to copy the link and, and paste it in the chat as well. Okay. So it's account.outofbounds. Oh, I've got the dev, the dev one. Um, is that, is that the correct one? Uh, yep. I think that's the dev right one. Yep. Slash account. Yep. Brilliant. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and so and what we, and this is once again, um, this is based on 
um, Villet's beautiful illustrations. And what we actually see is that we want data scientists to be able to do all of their modeling and feature engineering while having access to all the lower layers of the stack, essentially. This is something that's highly non-trivial to, to set up. So in building this playground, this sandbox, we really wanted to provide data scientists um, a, a nice place where they can go and play around with these tools without actually having to do all the, all the wild uh, setup um, it, itself. And maybe great... while Hugo... Yeah. yeah. Please go yeah, on. Yeah, no, maybe wait. Look. You go like while you click the button there. Um, I just want to mention that um, one reason also like why I think the sandbox is so exciting that like if any of you have read the book or are about to read the book, you will see that there's a chapter four that talks about the compute layer, like how you can scale out to the cloud. There's a chapter five that talks about the performance and so forth. And uh, and like in order to actually like test those ideas, like you can certainly like set up set it up by yourself. Like we have all the templates and so forth. It's not too hard. But I know that like of course many of you are busy and like maybe you don't have AWS account of your own. So that's why the sandbox is quite handy that you can test all the ideas from the book like just in the browser. You don't have to install anything locally. Absolutely, and that's incredibly important. And so what I'll get you to do, I don't need to click um, start my sandbox now because I've done this previously. But um, it'll take a minute or two for us to provision the Kubernetes cluster and all of this that we're, we're providing, right? So if you click on that, if you're playing along now, and I'll tell you this, this, this short story of a data scientist, right, who um, needs access to data, no longer local CSVs, perhaps, maybe looking at Parquet on S3 or databases or Snowflake or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, right, and this is something you saw a lot at Netflix, right, Ville, as... Um, People need to parallelize workflows to do multiple training steps at once. And as as we move beyond fit and predict um, in order to think about larger data, even marginally larger da data science workflows, you need to think about orchestrating these types of things. You do that via code, um, of course, but essentially you build graphs of steps. This is the, the data flow paradigm, essentially. Um, maybe everyone's aware of this, but if not, I'll just be explicit. These graphs are directed in that you have a start step going through to an end step and you move along it. They're acyclic in the sense there are no cycles. So that's why you've probably, you may have heard the term uh, directed acyclic graphs or DAGs. So this is one of those kind of complicated terms for something that's relatively straightforward to, to think through. Um, so we may need to orchestrate things, but we're also doing science, aren't we? So we may have, um, constantly doing experiments, iterating on experiments. When you start doing this type of thing at scale, you need to start thinking about versioning, right? Um, so this is part of you know, this graduated approach to productionizing. It isn't like production or not, or oper operationalized ML model or not. We have all these things falling into place that lead towards this, right? And we have mm -hmm. interaction, network effects between all these things. We need access to compute, whether it's Kubernetes or AWS Batch or um, GCP or whatever it is, right? And these are the types of things that this is so frustrating. I mean, I, I want to use cuss words, but I won't because it's not 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 safe for work. But these are the types of things that, if a data scientist, you have to do. Um, it can be incredibly frustrating and take a huge amount of time, bandwidth, and and resources. So that's yeah. And like you know, Hugo, I, I think that that is indeed the great paradox that like we are facing these days. That on the one hand, like we have all these people who have the desire to kind of build models and build these applications and companies who want to do it. And on the other hand, like we have all this amazing infrastructure. I mean, like if you think what has been happening on the cloud front and like even things like Kubernetes, like it or not, I mean, they do make, make engineers life, life easier, like at least in certain areas, but there's a gap in between. And that is the frustrating part, as you pointed out that like, there's definitely like there are all these applications that kind of like wait to be born. And then like we have the infrastructure that kind of makes it possible. But I mean, just like a breaching the two. I mean, I think that like going back to the questions that like what is the hardest problem for data scientists and like what Chip also mentioned earlier that it's really the tooling, the infrastructure that, yeah, I mean, that's that's really something that like we should be reaching. So absolutely. And I think it's worth like kind of drilling down into that and recognizing that a lot of this information and technology and infrastructure exists, but it's siloed in organizations as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're trying to right. kind of spread it as much as possible. I um I recently spoke with um our, our colleague Mark Sarafin, who's an applied AI engineer at Meta. He works on PyTorch. Mm -hmm. A big part of his job, I mean, they can deploy PyTorch in Meta seamlessly. Most people can do that, right? A huge part of his job is making sure that PyTorch can be deployed outside Meta, right? And making mm -hmm. it as easy as mm -hmm. possible for people to do that. So taking siloed knowledge and bringing it to, you know, 
I mean, for example, non-fan companies, right? Yeah. Where there's a yeah. lot of things happen there. Um, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I know that like we shouldn't get too philosophical here, but I mean, also what the book is much about is this idea that even if you look at the strong arc, like a really a long arc of, of computers overall, like all the way going back to 1950s, I mean, it's just amazing, like what technically has been possible a long time ago. And like people did amazing things already back in like 1970s. I mean, like you have the Absolutely. famous like Xerox parks and so forth with graphical user interfaces and, and so forth. But I mean, it hasn't been about the, the question that like, what is technically possible, but what is easy enough? And I, I think that that's really like when the big changes happen, even like mm. society wide, when when actually things become easy enough that like we can start doing these things really at scale. Exactly. And I know that it's it's all of you like listening to this live stream and like watching this video that like you have the ideas and like, I mean, it's not that like we have the metas like of the world, like building the few applications, but I mean, making it possible that like everybody can do the same. I think that that's the super exciting part. Yeah, very much so. And something I'm hearing in there is something I've thought about a lot previously, which is, you know, there, there are two, at least two different things at play. One is making the impossible possible. And the other is mm -hmm. making the possible widespread and easy yeah, and accessible. That's right. right? Mm -hmm. um, we have a great comment in YouTube from Mario saying, um, the attitude that is seen a lot on data teams um, is only data people are hired and they're meant to spin up the solutions and infra too. So that's something we think about a lot is kind of the cultural relationships and norms between um, infrastructure engineers, platform engineers, and the data scientists. And we want to build tools and provide solutions for, for this relationship to be as beautiful and productive yeah. as possible for, for organizations. Mm -hmm. um, so without further ado, I want to open my sandbox, which I'm very, very excited to do. So, yeah, um, you know, I have to say that, like, while it's loading here, that is that, like also talking about things that, like, I mean, like at the, how how quickly things developed. I mean, the fact that, like, you can have this actual IDE. I mean, like the fact that, like, I mean, this is like running inside your browser, uh, and uh, and like it's a full fledged, basically like a VS Code IDE, and like you didn't have to install anything. I, I think it's still. I mean, I, I always feel that it's a small miracle that they made it happen so thank you thank you microsoft also like for for providing the foundation for this so. <laughs> absolutely and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of, of vs code and this is a like a to say the least a souped up vs code on on steroids with access to all types of infrastructure and you and i are the people doing this live stream right uh with with, with chip of course but i I'd, I'd have to fire myself if i didn't thank all the wonderful metaflow and out of bounds engineers who worked so hard to 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 produce this um and also fantastic people to to work with um and it i mean it is exciting i think for me to be able to present you know i've part of my mission in life is to help scientists do do better science and faster science and correct mm -hmm. corrector science um mm -hmm. and being able to 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 provide tools such such as this is so useful because now we what you're going to see everyone uh watching we have access. If you did this with me, you have access to a Kubernetes cluster that's been spun up for you. You have access to a database. You have access to all types of things that would, would have taken you and your infrastructure engineers uh, a lot of hours, bandwidth, and 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 salary for the organization as well. Oh, well, by, um, by the way, Hugo, I, I think like now people are probably thinking that like we are trying to sell something. Um, oh, yeah. And, uh, I mean, the, the, right. So the, the point here is that like what you are seeing here is, is the open source Metaflow. You can go to metaflow.org. And like, you can actually like set up things like this at your workplace, open source, like all that stuff. The reason like why this thing exists here is not that like at some point, like there's a credit card pop up and like we start yeah. asking for money, but it's really so that like you can actually like kind of a kind of do a test drive of sorts. I mean, you go to a car dealership and like you want to do a test drive, like before you decide if you want to buy the car, kind of the same deal here yep. um, that like, I mean, we are not saying that like you should be using this very thing. Um, to actually do your work it's rather so that like use this i mean go there today i mean see if this makes sense for you and then like if it does i mean like please come to slack talk to us like we are happy to help your engineers help you to kind of set it up at your company i mean you can use open source for that i mean definitely of course i mean this is also like what we do with large companies if they need help to make it scalable make it enterprise credit uh, great whatnot but i mean like basically it's everything you are seeing here is, is based on open source Exactly. Um, and to be clear, you're taking, I'm taking a test drive of Metaflow, the, the open source framework and not any uh, vendor product. So it's an open source car that we're test driving. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hit run this current flow. We, you see, we have a file called flow, flow.py and then I'll kind of talk us through uh, mm -hmm. what, what's happening here. And we have a bunch of interactive lessons on the left here. Um, so we see we're uh, running some code 
um, and this is the, the exact code we're running, what you actually see is you'll see a bunch of, um, actually, I'll talk you through the result first. Um, we have in this flow, it's one of the simplest um, DAGs or graphs we can, we can do for a machine learning workflow. We have a start step, we have an eight step, uh, which reminds me, um, I'm, I'll, I'll be getting hungry soon. Um, and mm -hmm. then we have an, 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 an end step, right? And let's just have a look at how we define this uh, using, using Python and, and, and Metaflow. Um, we're writing a class essentially where we have functions within the class with the at step decorator, okay? And this tells us what are the steps um, in order to, we need to tell each step what the next one is and we use self.next and pass it, pass to it self dot the name of the next step. So we see self.next, pass it to self.eat. That tells us we go to eat. Then we have self.next, self.end, and that tells us end. And Metaflow is pretty unopinionated about how you write your flows. Uh, one constraint is uh, Metaflow wants you to have a start step and an end step, which is a relatively reasonable constraint as far as I'm concerned. What I want to make clear, because I am getting quite hungry, is that we can um, you uh, feel free to edit any of the code in here in order to run it. And I'm going to call this eat a lot and change the name of, of this, um, right? To uh, show you what, what happens when, when we do this. While this is running, I'll also mention that um, we have uh, relative, somewhat nicely uh, verbose output here. And we'll see why this is important. You may guess it's already to do with versioning your runs and steps and models and artifacts and that type of stuff. But we have timestamps, we have IDs, for particular steps in, in the runs, all of which allow us to really uh, retrieve any information from, from any run, which is pretty pretty darn exciting. Um, the other thing worth mentioning um, is when I hit run current flow, that, that's no magic. Essentially, you can that's an, an easy way of um, executing the, the flow from the command line, which I do with Python, uh, the name of the flow, and then run. Yeah, I guess you need to. Yeah, you need the whole path there, though. But I mean, yes, that's indeed the idea. So, do I need the whole path? It, it seems to. Yeah, I think that there is uh, like another flow, which is like exactly. kind of a visible in the last step. Yeah. Yeah, that that makes sense. <clears throat> okay, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a. a, a but I mean, indeed, work. I mean, like you can totally do it like uh, by yourself, and like, yes, yeah, that's like kind of a, if you are doing this without <laughs> Hugo, which is of course a sad experience. But I mean, let's say you have to do it without Hugo, then like you can follow the instructions on the right hand side. And uh, and they will kind of help you to, to kind of know like what you can edit. But I mean, basically, you are totally like free to kind of go go crazy and like you can write any Python code and like it, it definitely executes whatever you want. So absolutely, you can either like decide to follow the path or not. It's up yeah. To use. Um, and we have a great question from Ramon Perez. Um, are we able to comment on the differences between Metaflow as an end-to-end -end solution for data science and other workflow orchestration tools such as Prefect, Airflow, and and, and the like? I'll, I'll say a couple of words about that and then. I think when we look at um, creating uh, parallel processing, that may that that may help to answer some of that question as well. Yeah, well, maybe even the versioning. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I yeah, yeah. Because I mean, well, I mean, maybe like it's just to take a hot take on that question. Um, I, well, I mean, first, definitely the workflows are an important part of Metaflow, and but we actually, in fact, uh, we integrate with with things like Airflow. The Airflow support is coming out soon. We today we integrate with Step Functions, Argo, and so forth. But like what you see here, actually, like maybe Hugo, if you want to kind of even execute this code, I will. Uh, one big difference to do things like Airflow is that, uh, for instance, here you can see that we actually have some data here in the flow, self.x and, and so forth, and we manipulate that. Metaflow takes care of the data flow automatically, which is something that like you kind of have to worry about by yourself when using Airflow. And then the second thing, as Hugo pointed out before, is that like when you see all those IDs, it doesn't seem like much, but also the fact that um, like you have this 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 data going through the system and the fact that Metaflow snapshots everything, it actually like becomes a really useful form of experiment tracking. So so that's as you know, I mean, of course, like when doing data science, um, you absolutely like do want to keep track of all the experiments that like you are you are doing. And like of course, one option is that you use some dedicated tool for that, and then you use the airflow like for the or like workflows, and then you use a yet another system for the compute layer and so forth. But the idea with Metaflow has always been that like even that there are so many moving parts, it's kind of handier that they are all in the same package. That like you don't need seven different tools, but you, you just need one that then like integrates with all those amazing backend tools that let's say just do the workflow orchestrations. Oh, Hugo, are you still there? 
No, I think we think we lose him. Let's see if we get Hugo back soon, at least, or is it just me who's frozen? Hey, Ville, I'm back. Are you there? Hey, hey. That's my, great. Sincere, my sincerest apologies. Uh, I My laptop crashed. So thanks, Apple. Um, but the fantastic thing is that this wasn't an issue with um, Metaflow at all. That's right. That's right. Are we back online? We, we, are, we are back. Um, That's great. Hopefully we didn't lose too many people. Sorry about no, the delay. We, we still have uh, 43 people engaged and watching, and I very much apologize for for the delay. Um, and what I will do now is reshare my screen. Um, would you mind letting me know the last thing you were talking about? I presume it was to do with our orchestration. Uh, so what was the last part you heard? Um, we're talking about versioning. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I just mentioned, yeah, we were talking about the versioning and like how is Metaflow different from, from Airflow and, and so forth. And I just said that um, instead of having to use seven different tools, like to cover all the different concerns of, of machine learning and data science, you can just use one. And then Metaflow definitely integrates with many of those backend tools. So. Exactly. And I think that's a key, a key principle of interoperability, um, which is really important to us because I mean, you know, if you want to, meet data scientists where they are as as we do we need to make sure that if you're using you know scikit learn or tensorflow or weights and biases or great expectations that or airflow or gcp any of these things we need to make sure that you're able um to use them from from meta, the metaflow framework essentially yeah. um and in terms of what's happening here this may this may be um I think you have to run it again. I don't think we saw it since yeah. like, you left. So maybe okay. if you just click it again. So. I will. Um, and you may notice that essentially what we're doing is we want to make sure that you can pass data between steps, essentially. Data, features, models, whatever it is. Um, and you do that by, you can't just assign X equal to five. Uh, you need to assign it um, five to an instance variable, right? So we do it self.x, which makes it accessible in the next step. Um, and then we print the value. You may guess that it's five plus one is six. And we see that down here. Also, I was super impressed. I, I can't remember who worked on this um, at Metaflow and Out of Bounds, but the fact that whatever number I put in here then appears there. I was like, that's that's super cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, by the way, you got another thing that I have to mention that is super cool is the fact that even though your laptop crashed, I mean, like you can see all those past executions here, thanks to the yeah. fact that like there is that all that infrastructure. So I, I think like unintentionally, like this became a great example of like the benefits of like using the cloud and, and so forth that um, of course, like in any production grade machine learning environment, I mean, well, I mean, stuff that just happened to you, I mean, it could happen to anyone and like your laptop crashes. And like, if you do everything on your laptop, I mean, in the worst case, you lose everything. But the fact yeah. that like there is actually the centralized metadata service and this runs in the cloud, well, I mean, it's much less likely that at least like you spill like coffee on your keyboard or something of that sort. I don't exactly. know if that happened to you, but it it did not. But I, I that would explain it at least, right? Right. Um, I don't have an explanation yet. But the other thing worth mentioning here is that we actually um can see um you know all the time time stamps and run IDs which give us different values, right? You can see stuff I've mm -hmm. done uh, pre pre previously there, um, which uh, speaks to this idea of, of, of versioning, not only the artifacts, but the, that Metaflow versions everything. Mm -hmm. um, I will give um, a brief example of parallel processing, which is something that Metaflow 
um, affords at scale. So if you want to branch a flow into, you know, hundreds of different parallel training steps, you can do that, um, which isn't something that's afforded by a lot of other orchestrators. So I'm going to run this flow and just tell you the, the minor change we've made to the code here is that we're telling the start step that the next step is uh, the process step, but we're passing it um, the for each quag and we're passing that quag um, the list data, which essentially will branch it into um, two different steps, one called uh, process apple, one called process orange, and then um, we join them in a join step. So we see mm -hmm. that with a single quag, we were able to uh, create this, this, this branching flow. And we could provide it a list of 100 different models or um, a mm -hmm. thousand different, a 10 by 10 um, hyperparameter grid search or something along those lines in order to parallel. Yeah, and like Hugo, I, I think like this is a great like a segue for me to answer one question that somebody asked on, on, on the chat, which is that how is Metaflow different than MLflow? Because I think that this really nicely um, illustrates how it is different. Then uh, MLflow, um, it, it does a good job and at, at uh, experiment tracking and then doing model registry and so forth. Uh, but it, it it is totally unopinionated, like when it comes to how you run your code. Of course, like if you ask uh, MLflow people, I mean, they will eventually um, connect you with the Databricks salespeople. And like they say that, well, if you need large scale compute, you can you can do it on Databricks. But by itself, MLflow doesn't handle any compute. And what you see Metaflow doing here is that Metaflow actually handles the compute also. It handles the workflows. It handles the compute. It handles the data flow. And, uh, and in this case, like Hugo was showing, like, let's say you want to train 200 models, let's say for every country in the world in parallel, you can do it using this construct. And again, I mean, let's say if you use MLflow, this is something that you would have to think by yourself. And I know that of course they are working on things like MLflow pipelines and kind of becoming more like Metaflow over time. But I mean, always again, I mean, going back to that idea that uh, like you want to think about the full stack of infrastructure and not only like kind of some piecemeal parts of it. I mean, that that's really the key ideas. That's that's a wonderful point, and actually dovetails very nicely into several other questions we have. I'm before um, they're from Rick and um, Javier, and so I'm going to start executing this code first, um, and mm -hmm. then we'll talk about it because it will take a minute. Um, but what I want you to notice is that there's one step here that we've used the at Kubernetes decorator to now for, and what this does is it sends that particular step up to a Kubernetes cluster somewhere. So let's say you have a bunch of steps that you can run locally. This affords the ability to run everything locally and the, like the massive step you need to do, which may be like, you know, significant training on very large data, whatever it is, some deep learning, whatever it is, we're unopinionated about that actually, right? It allows you to send that step up, up to the cloud um, mm -hmm. or up to a Kubernetes cluster. Now, one thing that I'm, re as, as I've said, I used to work in basic science research um, in, in cell biology and, and biophysics and systems biology. And the iterative cycle between prototyping and actually writing operationalized code, whatever that means. That can mean a bunch of things in a bunch of different contexts um, can be really, really challenging. Um, mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that when you send, want to send something up to a Kubernetes cluster, that you don't have to reconfigure everything you're writing, then reconfigure it again when you're coming back locally. So that's why I'm really excited at the affordance of essentially merely putting an at Kubernetes decorator. Once all the inf is set up, as we've done for you here, um, but that scientists can iterate, go between prototype and production. As, as you know, well. Hugo, that, that like awesome. what you just said, I mean, totally reminds me of this. You remember Chip like wrote this blog post called "Data Scientists Don't Need to Know Kubernetes." Yes, I, I think it was like over a year ago, and I, I think it really like nicely um, summarizes that idea. That I don't know, like if if many of you like kind of who are listening have have used Kubernetes in the past, but it's a it's a complex complex piece of infrastructure and is complex for many engineers. At the same time, I mean, it is it is useful. I mean, the, the guys at Google know how to kind of do things at scale. But I mean, I, I think that like, at least for me and like maybe for you, Hugo as well, I mean, this is exactly the right level of abstraction like that I can just say at Kubernetes. I don't want to know like how it is done exactly, like what kind of a machinery goes behind the scenes. Um, but I mean, like now here's a function, here's a Python function and like, just make sure that it can be executed in the cloud. I, I think that's a beautiful level of abstraction. And I also, I know that like engineers at many companies who are then like familiar with Kubernetes actually like the fact that like, it is not some like a magical, like custom piece of infrastructure, but it is the, the same Kubernetes that like your engineering teams already have operational experience with. That is a bonus, but at least you as a data scientist, you don't have to worry about anything more than like just adding the decorator there. Exactly. Um, I am also going to post 
uh, I actually posted the incorrect blog post, but the um, that why data scientists shouldn't need to know Kubernetes, I'm going to um, post in the YouTube chat. So anyone interested um, can watch it, um, can read it, sorry. Um, and I just, I'm, I got a bit distracted. I, I saw a message, Rick said, Hugo is missing. I, I think Ville can hear me. If other people can just chime in and let me know if I'm missing, there is a 20 second uh, lag between recording and, and, and when it goes, when it goes live. Um, but I, I think um, this is a, a nice point, seeing we're using a Kubernetes cluster here, Ville. Um, Javier Porras um, is interested in how Metaflow compares to Kubeflow, in particular Kubeflow pipelines. Um, and Rick yeah. asked the question, is um, using Kubernetes to scale tools a part of full stack uh, data scientists as well? Or do teams generally use cloud manage or cloud DevOps teams to, to help them? So how much do people need to in interact with this type of stuff? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the question about the, uh, how is Metaflow different from Kubeflow? I, I think like in, in, like looking at all open source tools out there, I think like Kubeflow in many ways addresses the same type of um, pain points. <clears throat> and what I really like about Kubeflow as well is that they, they seem to have the same full stack mindset that they provide the compute, <clears throat> they provide orchestration. Uh, I think like kind of at least my impression is that they are approaching those questions a bit more from the engineering angle. So I mean, like the, I think like writing the YAML files, like using using Kubeflow is something that like may, may come more naturally for more engineering minded people. Whereas like we have really like kind of a, approached the question like more from the data scientists, like a pure Python, make it as easy as possible angle. Behind the scenes, um, if you are interested, like for instance, Qflow pipelines, like relies on this project called Argo Workflows, which is also same thing, one of the orchestrators that uh, Metaflow integrates with. So, so in that sense, like technically, I mean, both run Kubernetes, like both can leverage Argo Workflows. So technically like kind of, they can be very similar. Of course, there are many differences in details and, and Metaflow does certain things that Qflow doesn't do. I mean, maybe Qflow does certain things that Metaflow doesn't do. Um, so there are definitely technical details that might or might not make a difference to you. But I, I think like mainly you should be looking at the experience of like writing these workflows and then like compare. And I guess there may be certain things that are matters of taste and some things that are actually like technically meaningful differences. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic response. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to move on where we've just gone slightly over time, but people seem to be sticking around and, and, and really enjoying it. So I'd like just to take a bit more time to, to go through a few of the other things here, which in all honesty, I, I think a lot of um, a lot of data scientists I know would be particularly interested in. So I'm executing a new flow here, which does a variety of things, um, but we're talking about kind of moving towards production and what that, that may mean. One thing you want to really do is... Um, is freeze dependencies, right? I mean, we've all we've all not only entered dependency hell, but seen things in production break when when mm -hmm. we don't do this um, in, a, in an incredibly mindful manner. And so, um, once again, we have a decorator um, conda base which allows you to uh, declare a, a flow level uh, um, flow level dependencies. We have classic uh, PyData um, and and such packages here, such as Data Shader, Pandas, and, and PyArrow. Um, and we're using data shader for visualization. Um, on top of that, we you can uncomment this line for so, cloud if you'd like. Can I can I say one more thing about that? I think it's like worth mentioning about the Conda. So <clears throat> now I, I know that many of you may use Conda or may have used Conda locally, or like maybe you use Poetry or Virtual and, and, and all those are fine tools. But there's actually more than that Metaflow does behind the scenes. And these are actually as a result of some hard earned lessons and like a lost sleep at, at Netflix um, caused by dependency issues. And it's of course like one thing that like you can get things to install on your laptop, which actually these days is, is not quite as easy as it should be. But I mean, let's say that like you, you manage to do however you want. I mean, like at the end of the day, I mean, it, it shouldn't be rocket science, but it's a whole next level of question that like, how do you make sure that like these workflows really run robustly in the in the cloud. And that's why when you use the Conda decorator, not only it installs these packages locally, which is of course something you could do by hand as well, but it also like caches them in, in your own, let's say S3 bucket. So that let's say that even if something changes in the upstream uh, like package repository, your machine learning workflows won't break. And this is something that 
you might think that like, well, I mean, I doubt that it, if it ever happens. And like, I can tell you that this happened to us like a number of times. And it, it's really annoying. Like when your machine learning workflows that are, let's say business critical fail at night because some upstream package broke or like some upstream package updated and they're like transitive dependencies that are not totally frozen. So, so there's actually a bunch of stuff that happens behind the scenes when you use the Conda base. So, so that's, that's really the motivation. It's not purely a syntactic secure, but I mean, a lot of machinery going on behind the scenes. Absolutely. Um, and I'll also add something that I really love is, let's say you have some pretty heavy duty packages that you don't require for your entire flow, but you require it for certain steps. You can also assign um, a step level dependencies uh, as well, um, which is which is really nice as far as I'm concerned. Um, another thing we're doing in this is we're doing some validation of, of data, um, which is something else you want to start doing when you're you're moving to more, more production in environments. Mm -hmm. The other thing is we're producing um, uh, visualization cards using something called Metaflow cards and that we have in a Metaflow GUI that I'll actually show you uh, now that um, that is is quite cool. So the data set here you may have seen is the, it's the famous NYC taxi data set which shows um, fares as a function of location and time and a, a few other things. So we thought um, something interesting wouldn't be as uh, by days of the week, visualizing our heat maps of taxi drop-off location. So we can see, this is New York City. You can see the gap uh, um, of Central Park there, right? And we go all the way downtown. A lot of action happening midtown on Sundays, which makes sense. So Hugo, you were just like recently in, in uh, New York City. So like, where are like your favorite restaurants on the map? Can you see them? Uh, I, I can tell you a lot of my favorite places are down down here. So around the East Village. And then I used to live um, on Canal Street in the Lower East Side. I'm pretty sure that's probably where it is. And a lot of a lot of beautiful restaurants and bars there. I'll give a shout out to one in particular, Kiki's, um, which is it's um it's a it's a Greek restaurant, and the reason I like it so much is because they do an amazing Greek lamb, and um, I know you're a vegetarian, uh, Ville, um, but uh, there are lots of other delicious things there. But as an Australian who lived in the US for um you know seven seven or so years, um, we have a lot of good lamb in Australia, and in the US it was challenging, particularly on the East Coast, to find good lamb in California and Oregon. Actually, there's a lot, a lot of good lamb, but this Greek restaurant had incredible melt in your mouth nice. uh, lamb. So, um, and a lot, a lot of fun, fun places around there. But of course, a lot more action is happening down here in Brooklyn these days as, uh, as well. Um, yeah. So, so that's that's a lot of fun there, and the ability to do that is is super cool. I'm actually going to show you. I want to show you kind of the timeline visualization of what processes are happening. But I'm actually going to do that while we run the next. The next yeah. code. In, in, and by, by the way, like while, while Hugo, you click around on the UI, I, I do want to mention that also the UI that you just saw there that is also open source. Definitely, you can install it by yourself in your yep. own environment. Again, I mean, this is just to kind of a show. I mean, it requires that like you deploy it as as a service somewhere. You can do it totally however you want. I mean, there's a cloud formation template, so it shouldn't be too hard. But again, like for the idea that like if you want to kind of a Make sure that like you can you can see it before you kind of a quote unquote buy it, although it's open source, but I mean still there's a time commitment. So I mean here's here's how you can do it. So exactly. And and something I also want to share, we actually did um a blog post recently that you can check out on uh, out of bounds um dot com on, on our blog where we have um a, a GUI. It was using um uh, stable diffusion and, and metaflow, using metaflow to uh parallelize uh stable diffusion. And you can so what we did was we parallelized it with respect to um the artists. So we have subjects and artists, parallelize it with respect to artists. So you can jump in here. I'll, I'll include, I mean, this is so much fun. I'm going to include this in the chat and I'll include the blog post. Yeah, I think this is so mind blowing. I mean, this is always, I mean, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I've been like doing machine learning for, for like a quite a long time and uh, it's a, uh, it's kind of like easy to be, well, I mean, maybe not cynical, it's not the right world word, but I mean, the fact that even like neural networks have been around like for decades and like in that sense, it's not that new. And like many of these ideas are quite old and like there's of course a lot of hype and hot air about ML and AI overall. But, you know, this is one of the things that like kind of, I mean, I, I don't think that like anyone can be so hard headed not to be impressed by this. So exactly. And I clicked on, I mean, I clicked on, you can click on any of these. I put the link in the, in the chat. I decided to click on Snoop Dogg by Van Gogh because I that sounds fascinating to me. And we'll see. I mean, this is 
this is pretty wild stuff. And it yeah. definitively does look like Snoop Dogg by, by Vincent <laughs> Van Gogh as, as well. Um, and we do have um, another uh, UI, which I'll show. I mean, that's that shows you the grid that you can access. Oh, no, actually, I don't want to do that. Um, what I'll do is I'll run this code, um, this flow. And I think what I want to make clear here is that we've shown you a bunch of, um, of affordances of our sandbox, machine learning playground, and uh, Metaflow, um, but we haven't really done any machine learning yet. And I, I know like a lot of this was for pe pedagogical purposes to understand what's happening here, but it would be remiss to not, not actually show um, some machine learning in action. So I'm going to run this mm -hmm. flow. Um, it's a classic uh, regression on um, uh, the same data set. Um by yep. the way, Hugo, if I if you scroll up on the right hand side, um, I don't know. Hopefully, like yeah. So I think that that like a picture actually like really also like shows like why like we wanted to start with the foundation because that's the kind of the stack picture that we oftentimes exactly. use, and like we talk about the data compute orchestration that are kind of these foundational concerns, and like they need quite a bit of infrastructure, but are maybe not the ones like where you as a data scientist want to spend too much time on like once once everything has been set up correctly. So. I, like that's why I mean like we want to set, like start with the foundation make sure that like you are like in a good shape like when it comes to these basic questions that are kind of unavoidable in all projects and then like once you have that solid foundation I mean then absolutely like the rest of the time you should be spending at the top of the stack doing the modeling thinking about the deployments doing all that like cool stuff and of course the stuff that actually produces value for your companies precisely and as you see once again we've given you access to a Kubernetes cluster we're providing um, parquet files on on, on S3, so all of that work that you'd have to do, like getting files onto on, onto S3 as Parquet, is is highly non-trivial, right? Um, so mm -hmm. while while this is running, I'm going to explain what it is in a second, but I want to go to the to the UI for what's happening currently, because as we'll see in real time, we had our start step, which took around six seconds, our modeling step, our evaluation step, um, and, and and so on. So in real time, we can see what what's happening in our flow. Um, so while that's running, I, actually, I just want to talk you through a bit a bit more well, of, of this. You can see that, um, so as I mentioned, it's um, a regression task on the NYC taxi set where we're attempting mm -hmm. to uh, predict the fare as a function of features such as pickup year, day, hour, the distance between uh, pickup and drop off, longitudes of pickup and drop off, all of which seem like relatively sensical um, uh, features that 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 one could use. At the same time, we're using packages such as Scikit-Learn, Pandas, Pyro. As we've made clear time and time again, when we don't want to be opinionated about the type of packages we use, or even the problems you you work on. I mean, if you want to do natural language processing, or computer vision, or operations research, or any of these things, these are things that we really want to make sure that um, Metaflow um, it enables you you to do um, as, as as a machine learning learning practitioner. Um, and so this is cool. Our, our, our flow has uh, run and um, we can look at the card and we'll see we did a basic visualization. You can do any types of visualizations yourself, but the basic visualization was one of um, corrected, uh, v correct versus uh, predicted fair. Um, and we'll see we built a random forest using scikit-learn um, and a baseline model. And the root mean squared error, which is a standard error to think about when looking at, uh, it's not a standard error, like standard error of the mean. It's <laughs> like um, a, uh, one that's used a lot, let's say. Um, right. And, you so, know, Kiko, I mean, th 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 this is, and actually, by the way, I mean, like, yeah, people um, should go to Metaflow documentation to look up um, the section about visualizing data that shows how you can include these report cards yep. in, in your own workflows. But I mean, like, just as you can see here, I mean, this like really shows the power of data visualizations that I don't know, like what's going on with the data. I mean, like I look at all those like strange lines. So if I was actually like, if I was paid to work on this problem, I definitely would like to dig deeper and understand like the anomalies, there's something going on goofy here. Um, so maybe, maybe that is left as an exercise for the reader. You can definitely like kind of beat the results that we have here by yeah. understanding the data a bit better, better. I mean, this is not exactly Kaggle, but I mean, like, yeah, I mean, kind of, this is considered as a baseline. So exactly. And I'd be very excited to hear of people using Metaflow for Kaggle competitions and, 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 and that type of yeah. stuff, particularly with these built-in, um, ways to visualize.
Yeah, um, and like you know, I I think that could be your superpower in the next Kaggle because you can parallelize all these all these like different versions of the model. So I mean, maybe you have seven different ideas, and you don't know which one works well. So I mean, you just like run all of them in parallel. You can even do it here in, inside the sandbox, or maybe you want to do hyperparameter optimization, and uh, and like you can do that as well. So exactly. Um, and so just to kind of like wrap up what we've been been demonstrating here. I mean. Um, we want you to have access to all, all of these things and as much as as possible. With this flow uh, we've, we've written here, um, it's properly structured, maintainable, and testable as a software package, as opposed to um, you know experimental, iterative um, exploration um, that you may do in in in, in notebooks, for, for example. That isn't to say that notebooks can't be put into production, but that's a conversation for another time. Mm -hmm. I, I I think. Um, Every flow execution is contents are stored and versioned automatically. Um, you can scale things up using Kubernetes. We provide stable execution environments provided by Conda um, and human readable, customizable model reports are produced with the app card uh, decorator. There's a lot more to, to learn about here. And if you have questions, please reach out. Um, in terms of next steps, if you're, if you're interested, I mean, join Slack to have a conversation around um, what we've been talking about today. Um, but if you do want to use Metaflow in an enterprise environment, um, please do uh, get in touch with us at, at Out of Bounds. Um, there's also a free play mode here, um, which I'll just show you how to find it in a second. Um, and then you can also get started with open source uh, Metaflow um, by going to uh, getting started. And we also, as I said, one of our um, biggest um, concerns is that um, platform and infrastructure engineers and data scientists can have as wonderful collaborative relationships as, as possible. So we want to help the engineers as, as much as possible. So if you're interested in that, you can see our Metaflow resources for engineers. Um, in the bottom left, you can click free play, which essentially it's, you know, Metaflow and everything we're providing uh, without, without, the, without the guardrails. Um, so feel free to jump in there and have a play around. Um, yeah. I do, there are a couple of questions. Um, one from Ramon saying, does writing tests for your flows differ a bit from writing tests for workflows that don't use Metaflow? Are there gotchas to keep in mind when switching fully to Metaflow? Um, so maybe you can speak to that briefly, Vilay. Uh, sorry, what was the beginning of the question? Um, does writing tests for your flows differ from writing oh, tests yeah. for workflows that don't use Metaflow? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, well, I, I think that there are a couple of best practices when it comes to writing tests that like we oftentimes recommend. One is that you can certainly, I mean, the beauty of Metaflow is that you can certainly use all the Python best practices when it comes to testing your code. You can use frameworks like PyTest. You can, let's say, have your modeling code in a separate module or even a Python package. And then like use all the tools that you always use to kind of do the testing. You can even integrate that to your CI, CD and so forth. I mean, there's actually like kind of a, if you go to Slack and search for PyTest, there are like a couple of examples how you can do that. So that's that. Um, then it's a good question that like, if you want to end to end test your workflow, uh, again, I mean, Metaflow comes with the local mode. So I know that's what some people do is that they either have like a whole, like a separate kind of a staging or like a testing setup. This is what larger companies oftentimes do where they then like run the whole workflow end to end. Or like you can even use the local mode to kind of a test and make sure that like then in the end that like all the results seem valid. So they're like, as, as always with software engineering, like multiple levels of testing. And of course, always the big question is, is, the, is the data quality and like not only the correctness of the, of the code itself, but also like having maybe some validation steps like for, for the quality of data. And of course there you can even use libraries like great expectations on the data side. So again, I mean, that goes, speaks to the fact what we mentioned before that Metaflow is quite agnostic. And like, it also like kind of just relates to the fact that there are like amazing libraries out there and it doesn't make sense to kind of reinvent all those wheels. So. Uh, but like at least like when it comes to these foundational questions of data compute orchestration versioning, I mean you can use Metaflow for that, and then like use all the beautiful packages out there for everything else. Exactly. And so Harvey, I actually has a great question around containerization and package management and PIP and Conda and that that type of thing. But let's save that for, for Slack because I think that'll be a fantastic conversation with um, mm -hmm. some of our uh, engineers and our roadmap yeah. of what we're what we're thinking about there. Um, so I'm just putting one last comment in the chat, which is please, if we didn't get to your questions, please repost them on the AMA guest channel on, on Slack. I provided the, the link there um, and we'll be having our, our, our book giveaway as a function of the questions as well. Um, but I would like to wrap up by saying thank you all so much for, for joining today. And for those that stuck around this long, uh, thank you so much for 
uh, sticking around also. And um, Ville, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. I mean, you and I, of course, thank have you. had many conversations over the past uh, year and a half or so. And this is the first public one we we've had. And I'm deeply appreciative of yeah. a, a lot of fun. Well, thank you, Hugo. So. I mean, this is always fun. Like, we should do more of these. And uh, yeah, I mean, definitely um, give us feedback, like what type of content you would like to see. Please I mean, going it. back to the theme of this live stream, I mean, a big thing, what we want to do also at outerbounce.com, if you go there and like I click learn more, you will find all kinds of tutorials and how-tos and so forth. So, I mean, like we obviously like want to produce stuff that you will find useful. So not only, I mean, maybe if it's Hugo's restaurant recommendations. So, I mean, we will do more of that. And otherwise, I mean, just let us know. So. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. Thank you all once again.